Welcome to History at the OK Corral. History too real for the Westerns. Don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and leave us a comment if you like this story. The sources for tonight's episode were The Fighting Cheyenne by George Bird Grinnell, as well as a fantastic paper put out by Mary Jane Ward from Kansas University entitled Alternative Perspectives on the Battle of Wolf's Creek. Both were absolutely indispensable in making this episode and certainly worth a read. We highly recommend you check them out for more information on tonight's topic. Also, we've done an episode on the events prior to the ones in tonight's episode, and that episode is entitled The Massacre of the Bowstring Society. The link to that is included below, and if you haven't already seen it, we highly suggest you check it out for a fuller understanding of tonight's story. Now, let's get into it. Late fall, 1837, somewhere on the plains of Kansas. As the autumn wind cut through the prairie grass, its haunting melody decrying the harsh winter to come, a Cheyenne war chief named Porcupine Bear made his way from village to village carrying a message that was part sorrowful lamentation and part vociferous call to arms. He was the leader of the Dogmen, one of the Cheyenne's vaunted warrior societies, and his aim was to marshal forces to exact revenge for an incident months earlier in which 42 of his brethren had been massacred by the Cheyenne's most hated enemies, the Kiowa and the Comanche. Porcupine Bear's task was not as easy as one might imagine as the practical problems of a harsh oncoming winter that the tribe would have to survive with 42 newly fatherless families combined with the widespread grief of the occurrence of such a tragedy posed at least momentarily insurmountable obstacles to any plans of immediate exacting of revenge. But Porcupine Bear's cries were not falling entirely on deaf ears, especially amongst the younger men in the tribe's camps scattered about Kansas, Montana, and Colorado. Porcupine Bear's calls for action were enthusiastically received amongst this crowd. Then, Porcupine Bear stopped to visit family who lived with a band that he did not often see. There, he and his family members got drunk on rotcut whiskey, and Porcupine Bear's cousin became involved in an argument with another member of the band. Their words soon turned into a brawl, and the young men grappled about the camp, each trying to take down his adversary and begin landing punches. The opponent managed to take down Porcupine Bear's cousin and commenced landing blows at will. As all this happened, Porcupine Bear set off to the side, alone, contentedly enjoying his buzz and singing his personal war songs. Then, his cousin began to cry out, beseeching the war chief for help to save him from his current travails. So, seemingly unaffectedly, Porcupine Bear stood up, drew his knife, walked over to the tussling young warriors, and stabbed his cousin's aggressor in the ribs. He then called on his family present to come forth and help him kill this no-good ruffian who had the audacity to assault a member of their bloodline. This they did, and the young man was summarily stabbed to death in the middle of the camp. Now, though Plains tribes did not exactly have stratified official forms of legal justice, this did not mean that crimes were left unchecked, even those committed by vaunted and popular war chiefs like Porcupine Bear. A council was held amongst the elder chiefs, and it was summarily decided that Porcupine Bear, his family, and anyone who did not sever their allegiance to the His Dog Soldier Society were to be henceforth banished from the tribe. So, Porcupine Bear, his family, and a small group of a few dozen followers left their home camp bound for the open prairie where they would start anew, away from the official bands of the Cheyenne tribe. But just because the Cheyenne were now out of sight did not mean that they were out of Porcupine Bear's mind. While the elder Cheyenne chiefs had failed to take action in the initiating of any kind of retributive raid on the Kiowa and Comanche, their war chiefs had convinced the tribe as a whole that it was now time to move south, towards the known campsites of the Kiowa and Comanche on what is now Wolf's Creek in northwestern Oklahoma. As they moved south, they joined forces with their longtime allies and often inseparable comrades, the Arapaho. 
The Kiowa and Comanche had been long hated by the Arapaho, and any chance at exacting a toll on them was eagerly pounced upon by their young warriors. Shadowing this large contingent of Cheyenne and Arapaho, keeping well out of sight but always abreast of the situation, was Porcupine Bear and his outlaw band of diehard dog soldiers. Officially recognized or not, he was determined to get his revenge on the Kiowa and Comanche. After a harrowing trek south in which the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Porcupine Bear's band almost succumbed to starvation numerous times, the loose contingent came to camp within a dozen miles or so of each other. It was now early spring, 1838. From here, they would make ready for the final movement to attack the Kiowa and Comanche camp. It was well known to the main Cheyenne and Arapaho contingents that the band of outlaws were present, and fully intending on taking part in the raid on the Kiowa and Comanche. However, in this case, they were tolerated due to their martial prowess and because it was largely agreed that, in spite of his crimes against his tribal brother, Porcupine Bear was due his vengeance in Kiowa and Comanche blood, as he had lost many friends and family in their massacring of the Bowstring Society. The night before the attack on the Kiowa and Comanche camp, the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Porcupine Bear's outlaw band made ready in their respective camps. The women prepared all of their belongings for a speedy flight should the worst happen, and all their men be killed and they be made to run. The men, meanwhile, painting themselves and their horses, checked their weapons and sang their war songs quietly. Then, in three separate contingents, they headed south towards the Comanche and Kiowa camp. The Cheyenne headed due south seeking to make contact with the Kiowa's camp on the north side of Wolf's Creek. The Arapaho, a few miles away, headed to cut off the Comanche retreat on the south side of the creek. Porcupine Bear and his lot headed due south just a little farther west of the Cheyenne's main band in search of any Kiowa or Comanche they might find and be able to kill. They would all cover roughly 30 miles in the pre-dawn hours, but the main bodies of the Cheyenne and Arapaho would just slightly miss their intended destinations. They had left their women and children a few miles away, made an initial sweep into the territory with their scouts, and found themselves just east of the Kiowa on the northern bank of the Wolf's Creek. This would delay their first contact beyond the dawn attack that they had intended, and left Porcupine Bear and his band well to the west of them to their own devices. Porcupine Bear and his experienced dog soldiers had not missed their target, and their scouts had spotted a band of about 30 Kiowa warriors and their wives who had gone out on an early morning buffalo hunt. Porcupine Bear directed his warriors to conceal themselves behind a ridge. He took off his feathered headdress, styled in an aggressively expansatory fashion of the dog soldiers, and threw down his weapons. He mounted his horse and rode back and forth along the ridge making signs for the Kiowas that he had seen buffalo. The Kiowa men and women, believing him from this distance and in the dim light of morning to be a member of their own band, came towards him. Just as they drew close, Porcupine Bear rode over the ridge, beckoning them all the while to follow his lead without ever turning his face towards them so as to conceal his identity even at close range. Finally, Porcupine Bear urged his horse forward and galloped out of sight of the Kiowas down into the ravine in which his fellow dog soldiers waited, their arrows knocked and lances at the ready. He told them to be ready for in moments their opportunity would come and they must not waste it. And so, the opportunity came. As the thirty unsuspecting Kiowa crested the ridge, excitedly expecting to be led to a large herd of buffalo, they instead came face to face with dozens of dog soldiers adorned in their feathered headdresses, black and white war paint, with their weapons readied and their hearts burning for vengeance. Before the Kiowa could even draw their bows from their cases, the Cheyenne were upon them. They showered their arrows upon them with such great rapidity and accuracy that within moments every fortunate Kiowa lay dead. The unfortunate were summarily bludgeoned, lanced, or slashed to death, men and women alike. The last Kiowa man to arrive on the scene had time to turn his horse and make a run for his life, but his wife cried out to him, 
begging him not to leave her here to die. With the most valiant of intentions, the Kiowa rushed back into the fray in an attempt to save his wife, but both were quickly, ruthlessly cut down. Soon, 30 Kiowa bodies lay dead on the Oklahoma prairie, and as the morning sun rose to its full glory, Porcupine Bear stood covered in the blood of 12 different people that he had been witnessed to have either shot, stabbed, or bludgeoned to death. The horses of the dead were all rounded up, and the dead were summarily stripped of all their belongings. However, they were not scalped. Though an outlaw band, these dog soldiers still recognized the laws of honor, and, as they had been directed by the head chiefs of the Cheyenne that they were not to count any coup or take any scalps, they deferred to this authority. Besides, for this band of experienced soldiers who had lost much to their enemies, their interest was not in trophies nor in counting coup. They had come here to kill Kiowa, and this they had done. But the day had just begun. This raid on the Kiowa and Comanche camp would turn into the largest known and last great battle between the largest tribes of the southern plains. Fighting would rage well into the night and hundreds of lives would be lost. It would be known to history as the Battle of Wolf's Creek and showcase some of the most brutal fighting and most ruthless warfare ever recorded between warring tribes. The Kiowa would lose many of their best warriors, as would the Comanche. Many women and children would fall to the Cheyenne and Arapaho lances, arrows, and clubs. Many Cheyenne and Arapaho would also fall including several highly respected chiefs. Some warriors who had predicted their own demise in stark and startling detail, such as the Cheyenne Flat Club, would be proven nearly prophetic in their foretellings. And to be sure, the Battle of Wolf's Creek is going to be an ongoing series here on HOKC, complete with its own playlist linked below. However, for tonight, those are other stories for other times. But until then, what do you think? Was Porcupine Bear a hero? A villain? Maybe both. Let us know in the comments below. Be sure to click like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time here on History at the OK Corral. History too real for the Westerns.